So, good morning. Uh, today I'm going to talk about um, complex objects and um, distributions. And um, let's go on with that. Uh, no, wrong thing. So, um, first we have some literature, as usually, um, morphometry, uh, image processing handbook. They are usually pretty good. Um, then we, oops, it's kind of doesn't follow really. Then there is quite some um, papers which can be relevant as additional reading if you want to dig into some things. Um, and um, now we come to what we have done actually before in the QBI class. So we started out with defining the images. We uh, saw that they were noisy and needed to be enhanced in some way. So we learned about some filters. Then by looking at the histograms, we could also start identifying what things we could segment in the data. And um, segmenting images can be done in different ways. One is just you manually tune in something. It's not very reproducible. So instead we want automatic uh, methods. And we learned about also uh, methods to um, based on the histogram, uh, also unsupervised methods based on clustering, and going on to uh, um, um, supervised methods, which also uh, works in a way like clustering, or also going on to working with um, deep learning methods. Once we have the images segmented, we are starting to have information that we can work with. And with that, we, um, we can start doing measurements. I can count how, how many, uh, how large an object is. But if there are multiple objects, you also need to do component labeling to be able to identify this is some grain, this is something else, and that's yet something else. And once we have that, we can start analyzing each individual object in the image. And that is where we have this uh, single shape um, analysis. And then when we look into more complex shapes, it's maybe not so easy to identify really um, items, but you want more want to uh, know about sizes and depth. Then with that, we can look into thickness maps or distance maps. And this is what brought us to today's lecture. And um, now we want to look at skeletons and watershed segmentation. These are kind of extending the idea of looking at different structures. So let's go into that. Um, what we usually have, um, we have different ways of looking at the environment uh, locally or globally. So identifying items, looking at the neighborhood, or you can look in a global context of trying to segmenting items by self-avoidance, for example, or uh, correlation functions. So there are different ways of identifying objects in the image. Um, so um, <clears throat> we can look at different metrics. So one is nearest neighbor. Um, you can also look at um, different tessellation methods where you identify um, triangulator, triangulations and uh, looking at the alignment of the objects. Um, when you go to 3D, then you have a little bit different things because the neighborhood is different. And um, with that, you need to um, maybe rethink a little bit the way you're working with, but in many cases, it is sim similar, so uh, we can go on with that. Uh, today, we want to look into the topology of a structure. So until now, we have only kind of counted pixels or voxels, but now we want to know the span of it or how, how it is uh, aligned in, in, in space. Um, this works, um, so what we did before was more or less just considering the object more or less as some kind of sphere, 
um, ellipsoid, something like that. But that's usually not um, ideal to describe, for example, the anatomy of a, of a sculpture or uh, something like that, or a skeleton or a network of something. So then we need to look into how the topology looks like. And um, this overview shows more or less what we can do up till now. We have some image, which we can segment. Uh, using the distance map, we can, uh, in the background or foreground, um, we can look at uh, a little bit about the size distribution of the object, but it doesn't really give us any idea about the topology. It just tells us that this distance is more frequent than that distance. And um, that's maybe not really so useful. So um, what we want to find out is, for example, how many cells are alive. So with that, we may start some counting. We can see that maybe small cells are dead, large cells are alive. And then with that, we can look at the volume distribution. Uh, we can also look a little bit about um, the shape. So if the shape is round, it's swelling, it's happy. Uh, if it's spiky or pointy, it's shrunk together. So with that, we could look at to, uh, the anis anisotropy of, um, of the object. Um, but what we really want to know is if the cells are alive or mostly uh, where the cells are alive or where they are most densely packed. And that is something else we can look into. Um, densely packed, you can see through the distance transform. Uh, the other one you need to really identify if it is uh, something, <coughs> if it follows up on um, the other metrics I just mentioned. So one simple thing is, well, you can always visually inspect and say, this one is good, this one is bad. Um, we can also look at the positions, but did it really tell us so much? Maybe, but not for sure. Um, <clears throat> we can also make boxes uh, around the cells and, uh, and count cells in the boxes. Then we get a little bit about a spatial distribution. And then we can um, compare two regions within the image and maybe even between two samples. So if you have two colonies that you want to investigate, you can start asking questions between them and doing correlations between that. So um, what we still need is ways to count and uh, look into how, what the cells are without creating these arbitrary boxes. Uh, also, um, finding out how, how, where the, how, how close the cells are without, um, so it's nearest neighbors. And um, so, and there are a couple of questions we can follow up about uh, how, what we want to quantify. And in principle, it's good to make a little workflow, a, a, a script that works for one experiment, but we really want to go towards having a little bit more general uh, tool so we can handle a little bit greater variety of problems than you, your specific problem right now. So we should be able to maybe be flexible uh, to multiple types of structures, maybe multiple types of faces in the sample and so on. So um, this is a little bit what we want to aim towards thinking one step on one level of abstraction higher and um, try to make a more robust analysis for, um, for our data. <clears throat> that makes it useful maybe also in the next experiment and the experiment after that, even though it changed the, um, the experiment type, but still there is the same type of objects in it. And then you hopefully with small modifications can use the same uh, process on both examples. So um, 
the problem with many uh, imaging techniques is they are, even though they are claiming to be uh, non-destructive, mostly they are actually destructive. So um, X-rays, there is the problem of the X-ray dose. So much biological material is sensitive to, to the X-ray radiation. So you can't hit them with too much energy because then they just shrink together and die. Um, I've also seen publications like the wetting angle of water in the porous medium can also be affected by the X-ray dose. So that would actually change the whole experiment if you start bouncing a lot of X-rays on it. Then we have electron microscopy, autotome, and so on. They usually work on, you have to extract a piece of the sample to bring it in. And that's also destructive in the way that you have to cut up the, the large sample, but once you have it in, then you can start um, looking at it less destructive. <clears throat> um, then the other thing is when you have many uh, objects you want to align and work with, then you can also introduce artifacts when you start looking at the different um, samples in, in a sequence or something like that. So um, that's something you have to be care about, uh, careful about. So it's important to have this, to uh, have techniques to uh, allow us to compare different samples of the same type, but it should also be sensitive to common um, transformations. So maybe sample B looks the same like A, but it's all of a sudden twice the size. So your analysis should be able to handle these size differences. Um, also, maybe the volume fraction is different in different regions of the image, but the main uh, organization of the objects may remain the same. So there are a lot of things that you may encounter that in one experiment, it looks this way. The other experiment looks almost that way, but it has changed a little bit. So you, you need to have be, be um, prepared to, uh, to handle new cases. When we do the structure analysis, uh, we already looked into different things. Uh, we looked into area, we looked into perimeter, orientation of the objects. Uh, its position, I see a typo there, uh, and other things. You, you, um, you probably remember this uh, region props function, which um, produced 20, 30 different region properties that you can use in your analysis. Today, we will take this a little bit further and add on skeletons and advanced object labeling. Um, we already did labeling, but we saw that the normal component labeling had the problem that if you have objects that are very close to each other, they may be merged or seen and seen into as one single object. And this is a problem we're going to address in this advanced object labeling. Skeletons. Um, it's um, a method that we use to analyze thin structures in, um, in images. So we have some typical thin structures. There would be roads and rivers in, um, in the um, aerial photography. Uh, it could also be roots in the soil, or it could be blood vessels, and probably you can come up with something else also where it would be relevant to look at not the structures themselves, but just the abstract structure of them. And to to make conclusions about its topology. So what we want to know is to know, first of all, which structures are connected um, and then how they are connected. Uh, it could be that it's like um, just a spanning tree, or it can be that somewhere you have loops uh, in, in the skeleton and uh, in the structures. And that is something we can analyze with the help of uh, skeletons. Um, <clears throat> and then you can also look into tortuosity and branching. And there is a nice little 
uh, example here um, of this horse. I think this example actually comes from Psychit Image when they introduced the skeletons. And here you can see that the skeleton is the minimal structure that uh, spans the whole object. And if you would put um, try to draw back, it would actually be possible to reconstruct something that looks like this horse again. And um, usually you don't go back, but uh, anyway, it's, it's, it's a game. And when you do these algorithms, it's a game to go back actually and see how good you can um, reconstruct um, the object again. So uh, in today's lecture, I'm going to use this aerial image uh, from a little bit neighborhood where you have a street. And um, with this data, we also get an annotated image that shows where we have um, the streets. Um, maybe not all streets. I think there are some, no, it's maybe just the driveways. Um, but anyway, um, this should be corresponding to the streets in this neighborhood. And uh, now uh, we can look a little bit closer to it and see what it looks like. It's not a perfect line, but um, I don't even know if uh, this is manually annotated or if it's um, machine annotated. That, that I actually don't know, but we have the av information available. So let's try to find the streets in this uh, picture. First thing we need to do is to segment it. And that's usually always the first step if we want to look at structures. And this uh, segmentation is used, um, now we use the HSV representation um, instead. And um, we're looking at the V value of the HSV uh, color representation. And that one makes it easier to identify where the street is. We apply a single threshold on that image and you can see, well, we got the street, but we also got quite some objects more. So next step would be to remove um, unwanted objects and just a comment about the segmentation. Now we did this color space transformation. We could also do something like uh, k-means, which would cluster probably the gray colored things. That would also get us the roofs like we got before. But uh, anyway, that's something we could use and using k-nearest neighbors or even go to some um, deep learning method, of course. But all that requires training in order to get where the streets are. So we saw that we had a lot of unwanted objects. So we have this stuff here and that stuff and that stuff. Uh, we also get this piece here, which looks like some kind of stitching error in, in the data. So that one we also see. And um, now we want to get rid of this. And um, the way to do it uh, right now is to just do um, a label. Um, look a little bit closer here. Yeah, OK, this is just a close up. Uh, the pixels here are bundled six by six, so just to get a little bit more detail about uh, which label numbers we have in, in the image. So the first way to look into the skeleton is to look at the distance transform, uh, because we know that um, when we have a distance transform, it always goes up to some kind of ridge, uh, which gives us the local maximum in the, in the image, uh, in, the, in the structure. So looking at that, we compute uh, the distance map and you can see this ridge is clearly present, but it's not a straight line. It has local minima and maxima and it's not maybe that obvious. Uh, here you can see a little bit of close up also that we clearly have a local maximum uh, along this um, ridge point, but um, it fluctuates. But anyway, let's, let's try doing something on this. Uh, one thing we can do now is to use a Laplacian filter, which is used to uh, uh, focus on 
local high gradients. <clears throat> and um, when we do it, we can start looking at um, the skeleton creating as a minimum distance. The structure need to be at least some thickness. And the other thing is that the slope should be greater than, or the, the slope should be um, less than some given value in this um, Laplacian image. And that gives us now the skeleton image where we have these two criteria. It's a one if it's fulfilling these two criteria and otherwise it's a zero. And this looks pretty good actually, already looking at just at the Laplacian. You can see we have clearly places here along the central line of the object. Um, then there is actually an algorithm called medial axis in scikit image, which can do this according to this principle. And you see this skeleton is pretty much um, spurious uh, lines in it. It should just be this main structure. But um, <clears throat> we get a little bit more than that. So we start to need to do something called proning. Another way which is very popular of doing um, the skeletonization is a morphological thinning. The thinning is an algorithm that is based on um, erosion and it erodes until it re uh, reaches the thinnest structure. And that algorithm also checks if it's um, that it's not eroding from, from the endpoints because the endpoints would be very sensitive to erosion. And um, that can be iterated a couple of times until you have the minimal structure. And um, now we can do um, a sequence of different thinning. Uh, so we do the segmentation first. Now we have taken away uh, all the um, unwanted objects. We do a first thinning. Uh, then we do an opening and clean out a little bit more. And with that, we finally get already something that looks like the street. And this street, we now go again into do the thinning. And look what we get. Um, then once we have this skeleton, this is still maybe not the nicest, but anyway, we can start doing some analysis on it. And the very important thing to look at uh, are the junctions. And um, a junction is any place where more than two uh, pixels meet. So you would have a junction in this area, junction in here, and that would also be a junction and everything else is just straight lines. The way to do it, to, to calculate or identify these junctions. Um, a very simple way is to use a um, three by three um, box filter. And um, what, that, what it does is essentially just counting how many pixels are in this uh, three by three neighborhood. So if you look at um, this point here, you can see that typically we get only three pixels. We have the central pixel, we have one above and one below. Um, so all the green in this image here is in principle just um, the number three. If you have an endpoint, you have something else, then you only have two pixels. So it's a central pixel and another one. And uh, then there comes more complicated um, neighborhoods like, like this one, then you have even more pixels, uh, more counts. <clears throat> So if you apply the convolution with this box filter, you get this image. But you can see it's all of a sudden it's, it's wider than we wanted. So um, what we do now is to just uh, mask um, the skeleton on this one, and then we get the thin structure and we have the information we want. And you can see also here, uh, the blue one is, is a two. So that would be an endpoint and you can see every endpoint is actually blue. 
Um, we can look a little bit closer to it um, and you can see the values that are calculated. You can see in this one, for example, we have the size, um, the number four. So we have one, two, three, four pixels within this neighborhood. <clears throat> this one is a line segment, kind of, um, where you can see that it only has two neighbors and a central pixel. And then we have the end pixels, which are two. In this skeleton, I think we can even find a five somewhere. So let's do the counting. We can just look into um, um, the image or search the image for all uh, pixels equal to two, all pixels equal to three, four, and five. And you can see now, typically the twos are nicely the endpoints. The threes are the line segments. The fours are the junctions between the objects. And five is a four-way junction, so it's uh, even more complicated. And uh, <clears throat> I don't think you get much more than five, because uh, then the skeleton algorithm would be um, not as good as it should be. So this kind of coding gave us uh, just a count of uh, in ingoing and outgoing pixels. A different way of coding the kernel when the, in the convolution is to use uh, a binary values. So each position in the, in the kernel is, has its own specific value. And the central one has a large value. So what you can do now is you can actually identify what are the exact connection or what is the exact constellation in the neighborhood. So in this one, you have uh, only the four neighborhood and in this one you have the eight neighborhood and what you can see is that I have the, the binary weights going like this. This allows us to do some nice um, uh, analysis of the neighborhoods and the first thing is to tell um, if the compute the, the convolved value is greater than 256 then it means we have a pixel on the line, or on the skeleton line. If it's less than its background, uh, a pixel in close to the skeleton, but its background. And zero is, of course, background. Um, analyzing the constellations, we, because we have uh, pretty many of them, um, can that be done using either a lookup table. So in the, in the 2D case, is pretty easy. You can have a lookup table with 256 entries. And uh, that tells us exactly what kind of neighborhood we have. The other thing is you can also look at bit flips. So for example, if you would have, oops, let's, um, let's do it like this. So if you would have a neighborhood looking like this, that would give us um, the binary coding, one, one, no, yeah, um, zero, one, zero, one, zero, zero. <clears throat> so this is the binary number we would get out from this constellation here. And then you can see that um, if you do a um, bit flip analysis, you can see that here we have a bit flip up, bit flip down, bit flip up, bit flip down, one up and we put in a virtual zero here and it would be going down here. So we can see that we have three different segments in this um, neighborhood. And if you just would do the normal counting, you would only reach uh, the number five in this one, um, but we only have three connections. So that um, that's um, a way to be more precise on what kind of neighborhood you have. Um, so let's look at uh, what the different skeleton, uh, what skeleton looks like when you use the different kernels. You can see that um, the three by three box is pretty clean, actually. It's easy to identify where we have um, the vertical lines, uh, where we have the line segments, where we have the junctions. If you now start looking into 
the four or eight connected neighborhoods, you can see that now you can actually distinguish between vertical and horizontal lines. Um, or, and also diagonal lines would also be possible to identify. So this is an interesting thing with this coding that you can really see if you have uh, the orientation of the line segments. Um, <clears throat> also the endpoints, you can say in which direction the endpoints are pointing. And that's also a nice feature. So if you want to do an advanced um, skeleton analysis, this would probably be the smarter way to go. Requires some more coding, but um, you get also a lot more information. Sometimes you actually want to cluster some of the information, but that's another thing. Then you saw that the skeleton had a lot of branches that were not supposed to be there. Um, so we need to prune the skeleton. And usually it's model-based in the sense that you can put some constraints on, um, on the segments. And uh, these segments, uh, these uh, criteria would be that you should have at least some given length. Um, the width can also be used, but then you need to actually include the distance map. So you would have both a combination of skeleton and distance map. So you can also say that if it's not wider than a certain value, then clean it out. So now in this case, I have identified each segment, labeled them. And you can see here that we have different segment lengths. And then I mapped the uh, segment length on each uh, object here. And you can see that some of them are very dark, dark blue means they are likely to be um, bad ones and we want to prune them off. And um, that can be used, um, uh, so that can be used to prune the skeleton. And um, this is in principle, what we do is we have this equation here. We look at label length must be greater than five. Uh, we have, um, the convolution value of two, which are the endpoints. And we have also the neighbor convolution should be more than three. So that is just that it's a line segment. And with that, we have a pruned skeleton and you see some endpoints that are added still, but we have to live with those unless we clean them off with some additional morphological cleaning. So this skeleton looks already much better. There is still one, one piece here, uh, which is unwanted, but it's so, so large that it doesn't go away. Then we can also do um, segment width analysis. You can see that in many cases, we have the segment width of five and greater. And then there are some segments that are very small. So um, again, we can see that um, the small ones are still the ones that we should probably prune off of this um, skeleton. You can also see that this one is blue grain, greenish. So maybe this is also one we should take away. And um, if we prune that skeleton, it looks actually even better now. So it's... Um, even uh, we lost a little bit out here. But compared to the original skeleton, we have done a great progress in, in cleaning up. So this is uh, the kind of skeleton you would like to have. And that's also the problem when you do skeletons on natural images. Um, there is so much that can disturb. So if you have a misclassified pixel, all of a sudden you have a new branch. And that can be pretty disturbing afterwards when you want to clean up. Then we can also look at the um, topology, uh, looking at which segments uh, we... Uh, so we have already broken up into segments, junctions, and endpoints. And now we can look into more interesting things. Um, here is a nice little map now. I mapped the uh, skeleton on the, on the picture. And you can see it actually makes pretty good sense. Here is something strange going on, but in most cases, it makes pretty good sense. 
Um, then to get the topology of the image, you want to know which segments are connected with each other. And um, we have, if we have an image where we have a node, an edge, a node, an edge, and we want to know uh, how they are connected, we can label them. Uh, we have just node labels, we have one, two, and we have the edge labels. And by um, dilating the, the edges, uh, you can see here that you have dilated, oh, dilated node, sorry. Um, you have dilated this one and you can see which ones it's overlapping. And you can see this, this uh, pixel here is uh, overlapped by, by the node. That means the node and this edge, they belong together. Um, if you do the second one, you can see that it's uh, growing from uh, this node. So it's growing out like this, and you can see it overlaps also this pixel. So in the end, you can see that node one and two, they are actually connected. And, and um, on the other hand, edge two is only connected to node two. And for doing this analysis, there is a lot of code. Um, I'm not going to go, go into it, but essentially what it does is this um, uh, dilation and looking for which ones overlap each other. So, um, oh, sorry, that was not good. I have to go back and look into, yeah. So here we have the skeleton. You can see here um, which um, edges are connecting uh, which nodes. And uh, that can makes it possible for us to make a very simplified graph. So now it's only drawing lines between the, the node points. And uh, then we can also see uh, here a connectivity matrix, which uh, nodes are connected. And that gives us a diagonal uh, matrix essentially, because uh, it's very unlikely that, oops, um, let's see. Uh -oh. Um, it's very unlikely that you have a node here which connects with a node here. That would be a dot somewhere around here. And um, so this gives us actually an, in, uh, an overview of um, how the, the topology is of the, this um, structure. Uh, let's go back to the slides again. And the skeleton tortuosity is another metric that is commonly used also in tortuosity is also popular to look into in forest media examples and essentially it's the the distance between the points as so the direct distance between the points and the length of, of the arc um, is it's the ratio between those two so if you have something um, like, like this, it has a different tortuosity than if you have something that connects like this. And here we can see that for these uh, segments, we have um, a different tortuosity. And most of them are clustered up in this segment, meaning um, the distance, are, these are pretty straight lines, essentially. They're maybe slightly curved, but mainly straight lines. Um, and the more curved they are, like um, the hooks you, we had somewhere around here and here, uh, then they get a much lower tortuosity. <clears throat> So uh, we can also look into um, a randomly organized graph to visualize the network. So now we have uh, already our networks defined. Let's see, can't I do this? Just so much want to do it. No, it doesn't allow me. So let's go back again because this is something I want to show. And here you can see, um, uh, the whole network with color coding um, with different um, 
width between the segments. It gives us a pretty nice idea about how wide uh, these uh, things are. Uh, we and the let's see the edges are colored by the length and um, the width is set by by the width of the from the skeleton no from from the distance transform <clears throat> and then you can plot it like this also where you have the different nodes so this would be one two three and that corresponds to this part um, what actually puzzles me is that this graph uh, results in a, in a loop. No, it's now it's crossing. Okay, so it's making a kind of loop. Oh, let's see. No, I can't draw here now. I can draw with this one. So, so we are doing a loop like this, but this is no no junction point. It's just that it looks like it. So this random randomly organized graph is used just to make a, comp a compact visualization of the object. And um, let's go back to the slides again. Hello, slide, please. So um, another way is also looking at um, how many nodes are connected or the degree. Um, so we can see here that um, number of connected edges to each node. And then you can get a histogram like this. Um, this one is actually an inheritance from my previous lecture. I can't really interpret this one, to be honest. Um, then we can also go towards the uh, 3D. I mean, structures are usually in 3D. And um, if you want to look into different skeletonization algorithms and look for the 3D case, this is a, a paper which I, I would recommend to read because they give an overview of the different ways of how to do the 3D skeletonization. But um, <clears throat> an application of doing the networks in 3D would be this uh, root network uh, that was done as a master project um, two years ago. And um, we got a lot of 3D data, um, which was actually annotated. And uh, um, this uh, master project was about segmenting the roots in this, uh, in this um, uh, images. A side effect is that we now can actually compute the skeleton of, of, the, um, of the root system. Um, so why do we want to look at this? Uh, why do we, would we like to have the skeleton? So one thing is to look at uh, the soil stability. It's um, important that the roots are really expanding within the soil to make a stable uh, ground. The other thing is water uptake. Um, Depending on the species, the root network is different. Some are very flat, and other ones, they go directly steep down into, into the ground. Um, so what we have done was the segmentation. We can look also look at uh, segment length. We can look at the branching. We can look at branch orientation. And we can also look at influence volumes. So we can see if, how big volume is influenced by this particular branch. If we look at the, the root data, typically slices look like this, where we have only small spots uh, corresponding to where the roots are. So this is the horizontal plane and this is the vertical planes. You can see that it's only small dots that go through each plane and doesn't tell so much. If we would look at the projection instead, we can see the whole uh, network. So what I do is just to compute the average intensity through uh, the, uh, the image. And then you can see what it looks like. And now we can use, uh, actually, a uh, scikit image already has this skeleton 3D function. And uh, with that, we can produce a skeleton out of this um, root network. And that's much 
simpler to look at. Uh, you can also look at how well it segments the uh, produces the um, this network and I would say it's much pretty smooth root system this because it doesn't produce a lot of um, strange uh, segments or strange arms in in the system so that's that's pretty nice actually and with that I would actually like to make a break and continue after the break using looking at touching items. So see you soon. <laughs>